Let's get started, actually. I'll start just by introducing myself. I'm Michael. I live in Thessaloniki, Greece. I'm a, a Greek professor. I was a, I'm a third generation Greek American on one side and second on the other. So on one side, I had grandparents from Greece. On the other, they were great, great, great grandparents. Um, and I, I really wanted to learn Greek. I was connected to the country, uh, but I never learned the language. And so I got obsessed with it. And I'm obsessed with uh, teaching other people. I teach Greek at a university. I do private students, and I'm really excited about the Greek Academy because I think I think that technology is actually very capable. We're we're very able to learn to learn languages through uh, technology, and it actually is helpful to have an online community. Uh, it really it really the online environment I've seen teaching, especially during. COVID, when everything went remote, I've seen that uh, there are some actual benefits. Of course, we miss face-to-face -face interaction, but uh, if we're smart, we can we can make find some good things in it too. So uh, let me just tell you what, what we're going to do today. I don't think we'll go over an hour. You can feel free to interrupt me at any point. Uh, you can send me a message or you can uh, pop on here and uh, say something if you have any questions at any point. What we're going to do today we're going to talk about briefly just a bird's eye view of what it's like to learn a language, what's going on. And then we're going to talk about the right attitude and a couple of just helpful tips to how to approach learning language. And then uh, we're going to speak and kind of we're going to have a kind of checklist of things uh, that will be crucial to to efficiently, let's say, learning Greek, not spinning your wheels, but uh to, to really, really learn it in an effective way. So um, let me let me pull up a presentation here. And please uh, just shout out in the chat if you're not able to see it. We have this how to learn a language presentation. And you should be seeing a, a window here just that says how to learn a language. So how do we? Let's look first at the language learning process. So the language learning process is as follows. We're going to look at it first for your first language. What is it like when we're learning our first language? The, the amount of stages are argued about by linguists, uh, but we're going to keep it simple. We're going to have five. So the first stage is pre-production. Pre-production means what? You don't say anything. <laughs> Certainly nothing that makes sense. You're babbling. And you can actually divide this into, uh, into other smaller stages. A baby, when it's born, the first thing it does is cool. If you're around newborns, you hear that, they cool. The next thing they do is babble. Babble uh, has vowel sounds and consonant sounds in it. And the really fascinating thing is that when a baby first starts babbling, all of the sounds of every language are in those babbles. And as it hears more and more of a specific set of sounds, the language they're hearing around them, that range of sounds that they make actually narrows, becomes more and more specific until they really only make the sounds uh, in the languages they're hearing around them. That's pre-production. And the babies communicate by smiling and crying. Early production is limited comprehension. This is the first word stage. Oh, his first word was this. Her first word was that. Uh, these are one to two word responses, maybe a yes, maybe a no, maybe a, an I want, a very simple verb. I want um, no like, like I don't like, no like. That's early production. And then we have speech emergence. With, with every language, uh, whether it's your you're learning it as a baby, your first language, or if you're learning a second language, we always comprehend uh, more than we speak. This is certainly true uh, for kids. Some kids will really, uh, and it's especially true of bilingual kids, they will not speak for quite a while. And then, but they have a, a great understanding of the language that they've absorbed around them. And then they'll start speaking. So sometimes people are surprised at the things kids say at the level it's at, because they've been absorbing and not saying anything. And then suddenly they start to, uh, speech starts to emerge. Uh, so this is this is pretty good comprehension, stage three. It's pretty good comprehension of what's going around them. 
they'll they'll make pronunciation mistakes, they'll make grammatical mistakes, and they won't always understand jokes. So uh, this stage three is the stage of baby books. It's the stage when kids are saying funny things. Stage four, intermediate fluency, uh, is pretty excellent comprehension and then very few errors. This is probably about the level of a three or four-year-old. And then five, advanced fluency. Uh, while a five-year-old won't be able to uh, tell you about the Civil War in America, uh, in the context in which they're familiar, say playing at the playground, they're absolutely fluent. They won't make mistakes and they'll speak with great ease. So that's what it's like. Those are the stages of the first language acquisition. How is it different in the second stage? Well, or in second language acquisition, there's this first period called the silent or receptive period. And this is argued about. I actually argue against it along with many others. But some say there's a point in which we start learning a second language. You start learning Greek, say you're at the beginning. You're not really going to do much talking or production. Uh, you're going to just absorb, absorb, absorb until you have maybe 500 words that you know. And then you might have the courage to uh, put together a sentence or two. Of course, uh, that is respected, but I don't think it's the most effective thing. I think that as we learn a language, every word that we learn, we should try to use. And that's, you see this all over. You see it especially in teaching language English as a second language. We do a lot of repeating. If I introduce a word to you and I say, Zapatsulika, uh, Zapatsulika, and you're like, what's that? Well, if you say it 10 times, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to, first our mouth has to learn it. And uh, so it's good to practice. So silent receptive stage, uh, that is or is not, it's up for debate whether that's a real stage here. But the second stage, early production is certainly true. Early production is when you understand maybe a little less than a thousand words and you speak some words and phrases and you form short sentences. So I like coffee. I want to go to the Acropolis. This is kind of early production. Stage three, speech emergence. And you know, uh, the, you'll notice that this parallels the first language acquisition. Speech emergence is when you have about 3,000 words, 3,000 words. Uh, and at this point, you have basic conversations that aren't routine, that aren't sentences you've already heard but that you're actually putting together. So you're not just repeating, but you're actually putting things together and making your own sentences and expressing novel ideas, ideas that you haven't heard expressed uh, elsewhere. This, this is what I call speech emergence. I call this uh, spring break fluency. So I would call early production, I would call that tourist fluency in the sense of maybe you get a phrase book, if you learn it well enough, you're going to be able to say, I want to go to the Acropolis, please and thank you. Okay, that's maybe tourist fluency. Speech emergence, I call it spring break fluency because I remember going to Mexico when I was in high school and I learned some Spanish. And I was very proud that uh, instead of just being able to order, let's say, uh, what I wanted to eat, I was also able to talk with the staff and tell them, you know, a bit about my family, where I was from, what I wanted to do with my life. It was very simple. I, I, they had no question that Spanish was not a native language with me, but I was having some uh, new and exciting conversations in the second language. So this three speech emergence is an exciting stage to be at. Uh, stage four intermediate fluency uh, is about six thousand words. You communicate with relative fluency. Uh, you can't. You really don't have a hard time with comprehension in almost every situation. You might hear one word for uh, here and there that you don't know, but you totally understand what's going on. Uh, and this is often what I would say heritage speakers of a language have. So maybe if you're a, a first generation, maybe your parents were from another country, you might speak their language at this stage, and it's a it's a very good stage, and it's what I think we usually look at as as real fluency. Of course, uh, stage five, advanced fluency, continued growth. There is, there is, there is a much higher ceiling. If you want, I think it's, I think it's an incredible task when people achieve it. It's often people who have have lived in another country for years. 
or whose work uh, really demands it. But advanced fluency means, yes, someone might uh, see that you have an accent, but they, there, is, there is total ease of, of conversation with you in almost every realm. You might not be able to talk about computer science if you're not a computer scientist, but you can talk about anything else, uh, history, what, whatever is, is kind of a common thing to talk about, you're able to do it eloquently. Um, so that's stage five. And, and I believe that everyone can get there. Uh, it just takes some, some patience. So moving on, let's look at the different ways to approach language learning and teaching. Okay, so if I show you here uh, this book, this book is by a man named Scott Thornberry. He's very popular, uh, and he goes through 30 methods of teaching language. These are all in this gray box called traditional learning, and they're on a spectrum. One side of the spectrum is a natural method. Natural method means you come into the classroom, and we don't speak any any of your native language. It's all in the target language. There's no explanation of what's going on. It's just communicating. You come into the classroom. I say yasu, katse, fkaristo, dose, stilo, stilo, and I just start talking to you in the language. That is the extreme of a natural method. And then there's also, on the other hand, linguistic methods in which you would learn about the language almost like it's a science. You might compare Greek and English and look at the sentences and say, well, you know, the word agapi in Greek means love, but it doesn't quite just mean love. Like uh, when we say I love cookies or I love Sally, it means something else. And we might compare sentence structures and be very grammatical and fill out charts. Those are the traditional methods. And then of course, modern learning is what? It, there, a new avenue has been opened up and it's the internet, it's uh, data, <laughs> a lot of information at our fingertips. And so uh, modern learning, I have on there a picture of Steve Kaufman. He's a famous internet polyglot. Uh, polyglot. So he, it's kind of a new phenomenon. People who learn languages, uh, for better or worse, they learn them almost all just through, through the computer screen. Modern learning uh, really focuses on, I mean, it, it has a convenience, right? You can, and you can also follow your interests. So Duolingo is a good example of convenience. It's on your phone. You can practice. Uh, it has the record. You don't have to press a separate button to hear the word said. It says it automatically. Um, and then like YouTube, I have the YouTube arrow up there. That's a good example of being able to follow your interests. You can say um, cooking vocabulary in French, and you'll find that if you like cooking. You can say sports vocabulary in German, and you're going to find that modern learning. So with traditional and modern learning, natural methods, linguistic methods, everything the internet offers, apps, uh, YouTube, Instagram, what's the right, what's the right method? What's the right method? <laughs> of course, uh, there is no right method. <laughs> the right method is balance. The right method is to use all of them, use all of them. So we use some, uh, some very natural methods of learning, but sometimes we look under the hood and see what's going on in the language. We figure out why something is said how it is. We don't we don't look down on on things like uh, following someone on YouTube. If we like it, we're going to follow our interests because we're going to be spending time in the language, which is very important. We're going to use all the apps that work for us. We're going to use Duolingo. We're going to use Quizlet as one that. Uh, we use at the Greek Academy, we're going to take advantage of everything and we're going to balance it. So let's look now just at a few tips. And uh, these tips in some ways are common to all people and in other ways uh, are personal because uh, like I said in the beginning, I learned Greek from, from a, a very low level uh, to a fairly high level. And uh, these are some things that I either heard from other people and applied and saw they had an effect or things that I just figured out as I was stumbling through them. Uh, the first thing I have there is uh, as a trait of a successful language learner is self-knowledge. You have to know why you're learning. Okay, this, this is very important for anything we do because 
when the going gets tough or just we're a little tired, if we don't have a reason, if we don't know why we're doing something, we're going to stop. We're just going to be guided by our whims. We're not going to be able to fall back and say, you know, I'm tired, but I'm going to look for five minutes at these vocabulary words because it's important to me to learn Greek, because it's important to me to, I don't know, be able to visit and travel in Greece, uh, be able to make friends in Greece, be able to communicate with my family or my in-laws in Greek. We have to know why, and it's good to keep that at the front of our mind. So one important trait, maybe the most important trait of a successful language learner is to work in your why. Second important trait is honesty. And here I mean honesty with oneself. We have to be honest about our strengths and our weaknesses. Honest about our strengths means not feeling guilty for doing things in the language that we like. It's actually of great benefit that there are so many things we can do uh, with Greek just by opening up a laptop. Like I gave those examples, you like cooking, you like travel, you like sports, follow your interests, do the things you like, because for better or worse, any time you spend using the language is helping you. As much fun as it is, you might think you're not learning anything, you're going to learn something, even if it's just listening to songs you like. So that's honest with your strengths. Honest with your weaknesses means also recognizing, and I think this is something that uh, is not said too much in the uh, when people are doing something like Duolingo. Duolingo promises that it's all going to be easy. And I don't want to uh, <laughs> disparage Duolingo. It's it's a great app, and uh, and it and it's a nice. Uh, I've seen uh, the CEO interviewed. I mean, he really seems to to have done that app out of his heart. He's actually the same guy who made captchas on our on our computers. Same guy who made that. That's a side note. Duolingo promises that it's going to be easy to learn a language. A lot of a lot of <laughs> there's there's things called easy talk. Easy talk. Of course, it can be pleasant to learn a language. But for someone to tell you that there's not any effort and you're not going to have to ever try, like try to remember what a word means or maybe write down the same word you heard but forgot, you know, two or three times, that's that's not realistic. To actually learn a language, we, we need some work. And so there needs to be some honesty about our weaknesses. And we have to say, okay, I don't love I don't love sitting down and doing and doing it and translating something. I don't love that. So don't do it all the time. Don't make that the bulk of your work, but do some of it so you don't end up with a gap. Okay, that's honesty. The third point here in the traits of a successful language learner is authenticity. And here, I'm not talking about authenticity with yourself, but with the people around you. And what I really mean, and this is actually important, uh, psychologically for us, when we learn a language, of course, in life, we want to seem good at things. We want to seem competent. <laughs> and it's very hard not to be. So whenever we're on the edge of our ability, whether you know some Greek and you're trying to specialize and learn learn a vo medical vocabulary, or you know no Greek and you're trying to take those first steps, you're on the edge of your knowledge. There are some things you don't know and you will feel incompetent. And that's okay, because if we're not in, ever on that edge of incompetence, we're never going to learn. We're never going to pass that edge. So as a language learner, we have to be authentic about where we are. Why am I saying this? I'll say this to you specifically. When I was learning Greek, when I would first travel to Greece, I wanted, I never wanted to give away, say I'd studied for a year or two, I never wanted to give away that I wasn't a native speaker. And so what would I do? Well, I would really only say things I know. I would only speak loudly when it was a conversation uh, that I was comfortable in. And I would often not speak. I would not speak. I would just nod um, or I'd, I'd just mumble something. So it seemed like I was a native speaker. I was more focused on uh, what people were thinking about me than communicating with them. And that's probably because, you know, I have Greek heritage. And, and so 
I was a bit embarrassed that I didn't know Greek. That, of course, is silly. It's silly. <laughs> if you want to learn a language, uh, people are going to support you. Speakers of that language are going to support you and be thrilled. But instead of trying to uh, pull wool over anyone's eyes about where we are in the language, we should be where we are, and we should be excited to communicate, connect with people using this language. And if we're authentic, I guess, in where we are in the journey, we are much more quickly going to advance to real fluency, to real comfort, rather than uh, speaking as a show. We want to speak to communicate, not to impress. Okay, so that's authenticity. That's important. And it's connected to fearlessness. Uh, one thing I remember a professor saying to me that uh, has always resonated is that perfectionists never learn a language. And this person knew seven or eight languages. And I think that's true. If, if we're not willing to make a mistake, we're, we're going to miss out actually on a lot of opportunities to learn. Some of the things I remember the most come from being corrected from saying something and maybe even raising my eyebrow because I'm not sure is that how I should say it, and then letting myself be corrected. Something else to keep in mind, if you're fearless and willing to make mistakes, especially with speakers proficient in the language, uh, you are going to, you're going to have a lot of valuable feedback that will stick with you and will help you remember things much more than if you just read some rule in a book, okay? So we want to know why we're doing things. We want to be honest with ourselves when analyzing how we're how we're studying and engaging with the language we want to be authentic in where we are in the journey where we want to be and then we want to be fearless uh, we want we want to be ourselves let me now just talk about the language journey so here i want to give some just practical uh tips and i'm actually going to open up a bit to see the Zoom meeting, just to make sure nothing was going on in the chat that I didn't see or anything. Okay. No, I don't think I missed anything. Sorry that this is a bit uh, one-sided right now. Everyone's getting to know each other. Uh, this is, again, the first, the first learn along, the first live class we've done. So packing for the language journey. Here's a checklist, a practical thing. Whether you whether you engage at the Greek Academy or you're just gonna go learn Greek on your own, take these take these uh, this checklist into account, please. First, you have to find your educational program. This is a bit on that traditional learning side of things. Learning a language uh, means you have to you have to be somehow guided through it. You need information about the language, how it works, how do you how do you say a word? How do you change a word if it's in the future, the past? And then uh, not only information about the language, but some sort of programming of, okay, here's what's important to learn first. Here's what, what's important to learn next. So an educational program can be in, in the form of, I have a million textbooks on this, this, this shelf up here. <laughs> it can be in the form of a book. It can be in, in the form of a one-on-one on one teacher. It can be in the form of uh, an asynchronous online course. People have like just video courses, uh, or it can be the form of something like uh, the Greek Academy has, which we'll talk about a bit later. So find your program, decide what, what you're gonna use, let's say as the base of your learning. And then you wanna dip into immersion. And this is something that we can do now. You could, as, as we're on this call, you could pull out your phone <laughs> and you could go on YouTube and you could, find some channels that you like, whatever applications you might use, uh, whatever speakers you might follow, whatever it is, you could go there and just subscribe to them. And then you're going to start being exposed to Greek. You're going to dip into immersion from, from now. You're going to be hearing more Greek tonight than you did uh, this morning, let's say. So take advantage of the fact that you can hear Greek and see Greek everywhere uh, nowadays. There's so many places to do it. Take advantage, start immersing yourself now. And at some point, maybe you'll get extreme. I remember when I was at uh, doing one of my degrees and I'd learned modern Greek for the most part, I would take my class notes in modern Greek, though I was in America at that point. Uh, but I was trying to immerse myself. And anytime we'd have a textbook that I could find translated into Greek, I would go and get that translation 
And I would read that instead of the English textbook. The more you're exposed to the language, uh, the quicker you're going to learn. And maybe you're going to be exposed and not use the things you're seeing. Maybe you're going to hear a word today, but you're going to you're going to use it in five years. You you it builds up slowly and sometimes under the surface. But it is all uh, it is all trust me worthwhile. Every minute of exposure to the other language. And then uh, step three, checkbox three, and packing for the language journey is to commit to a routine. It's important to be realistic about what you can do, but it's also important to be consistent. So one trap that language learners fall into is being very enthusiastic. Okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna study two hours a day. And then after two weeks, they're done with it. <laughs> Uh, you need to be a real realistic, look at your schedule, and in a very uh, calculated way, look at the actual time. Say, okay, I'm going to spend, I'm going to set a little alarm, I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day on Greek. I'm going to spend 20 minutes a day on Greek. Or maybe it's your first month, I'm going to spend 30 minutes five times a week on Greek for this first month. And then the next month, maybe 25 minutes. As you get more and more comfortable with the language, you may be more efficient in your studying. Point four here is to start a language journal. And what do I mean by that? We could start it now. <laughs> I remember when I went to Greece uh, and I'd, I'd hit the speech emergence point. So I was able to start having some conversations. I remember going with a notebook and I still have it, though it's, it's in America and I'm in Greece right now. I remember going with a notebook and writing down words that were important to me because uh, language is personal. Your use of Greek is going to be very personal. You're going to want to be able to say things about yourself. You and I are different. We do different things. We have different hopes and dreams. We use different phrases. We express ourselves differently. So if you should have, yes, a dictionary. <laughs> but also a personal dictionary, a real language journal of things that matter to you, things you remember, things you like, things that stick out, things you wanna be able to say or, or want, to, uh, want to be able to, to, to repeat uh, and, and to make your own. All of those should go in, I always suggest, just a very personal actual notebook, a pen and paper. So I would start a language journal and then the fifth point is very important. It's to engage in a community. And that's really uh, at the Greek Academy, what I'm trying to do here. I've, I've, I've taught classes of students. I've also taught one-on-one -on -one students uh, for a number of years. But what is lacking often, especially in, when you're trying to learn a language online, is a community. It's feeling like you have classmates, feeling like you're on a study abroad and you have friends that you do stuff with. You need to find a community that you're going to actually practice the things you're doing in. Okay. So uh, that's the end of this presentation. What I want to do now is, is just show you quickly how the, how the Greek Academy uh, is trying to hit these points, help you pack for the language journey. But I'm going to stop just for a moment. I've talked now nonstop for about a half hour. I'm going to stop. You can put it in the chat. You can log on. If anyone has any questions or comments I'd, I'd love to uh i'd love to hear them now so i'll just pause for a moment take a sip of my coffee i'll watch the chat too okay okay um well you can you can ask questions at any point let me let me keep moving on um let me move on and show you a bit into the greek academy so i'm actually going to stop this the screen share and show you show you around the Greek Academy. Actually, first I'm going to show you 